today is a different episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I've talked about conspiracies I've been involved in. I've talked about paranormal events I've been involved in. But today we're going to talk about one of my true crime cases. It's nothing revolutionary, but I think it'll give you an insight to my past and to how I became who I am today. I hope you enjoy today's episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. We're going to dispense with many of our normal things. I didn't want to take a Patreon or long for this ride. Figure it wouldn't be fair. Carpenter Copter is going to stay grounded. The Jason Jalopy is going to be sitting in the garage. I want to tell you guys a little story. A little story about old Jason. Old, well, I was younger, but old Jason. The Jason that I used to be. And I think it shows how I became who I am today. So let me take you back to the early 2000s. We are in Antelope, California. Antelope is a suburb of Sacramento, and it's really, really far off in the outskirts. It actually stood in between a lot of bad areas. Antelope was mostly a suburban subdivision. Lots of nice homes, lots of nice families. But it bordered against Watt Avenue, which which it was not a, a great place to be on. It was a massive road. It's still there. It didn't disappear. Godzilla didn't eat it. It's still there. But I haven't been down that road for quite a long time. It's a long road that pretty much takes you all the way from the suburb of Antelope to uh, the city of Sacramento proper, more or less. It also borders Rio Linda, which is, it's really interesting. The whole area was like a GTA map. Because basically you had this area that had a lot of like punk kids, which would have been antelope. You had a lot of like punk rocker kids. You could get into trouble with your local neighborhood drug dealer selling weed or something like that. Or some kid just trying to make a name for himself. And then go three miles and you're knee deep in redneck meth in Rio Linda. Sorry, sorry, Rio Linda. But, But you know it's true. You know it's true. In that same area was Dyer's Lane which was a road that was supposed to be haunted. I spent many a nights driving down Dyer's Lane looking for ghosts. Had some weird encounters on that. We'll save that for another episode. I I might have already told those stories, actually. And then when you go about five miles down Watt, you're in gang territory. Maybe a little more than five miles. But once you hit Omega Court, you didn't want want to hit Omega Court. It was very interesting. Watt Avenue was this long stretch of road. It was four lane. It still exists, Jason. It's a four lane stretch of road that cuts all the way through all these other suburbs. And there's this little tiny court called Omega Court, uh, just uh, k- kind of right off Watt. Don't go there. Don't go there. If you live there, um, you're totally awesome. I have a lot of respect for you. I'm glad you're listening to my podcast because the hardcore gangbangers lived on Omega Court. Uh, Sacramento was one of those weird towns. Where, depending on which way you turn down any given street, you are either in a totally safe neighborhood or a very, very dangerous neighborhood. You have that in Citrus Heights as well. You'd have that in Elk Grove. And you have that off of Watt Avenue. So anyways, I used to work at Godfather's Pizza. That doesn't exist anymore. At least the one in Antelope doesn't exist anymore. I used to be a delivery driver for Godfather's Pizza, and I totally loved it. I could listen to my music all day long. Yes, I had to (laughs) deliver pizza in meth-infested Rio Linda, and I remember one night, it was 10 minutes before we were supposed to close, and we got a order for Omega Court, and I said, I'm not doing it. I am not going to Omega Court. I want to go to Omega Court. <laughs> I want to go to Omega Court in, in, in the afternoon. The sun could literally have a smiling cartoon face on it. I'm not going there. My boss was like, I'll give you an extra five bucks, and I look at him, and I go, that's not that's not enough. Five who what? That that is not enough for me to risk my life. And then so the bot he already taken the order, so the boss was like, fine, you punk, you coward. I don't know if he actually called me a coward. He might have used another word that means that, but he delivered it, and <laughs> I was like, Well, I guess he's murdered. I guess I got a promotion. I'm the boss now. And he didn't. He came back totally fine. But still, <laughs> just the stress alone would have added ten years to my life, that drive to Omega Court. Uh, the amazing rapper Hollow Tip talks about 
Omega Court. He's actually from Omega Court. So, anyways, I used to work at Godfather's Pizza. I had quit. I had quit that job, and then I was working at Circuit City. So, this is in the late '90s, early 2000s. I don't remember the exact year, but I had just gone off work at Circuit City, and I was dressed up nice. I always, a lot of times back then, I wore dress shirts and nice slacks, really nice shoes. The key is, is that if you know you're going, this might sound counterintuitive, but if you're going to be in a that Godfather's Pizza was on the border of a of an okay neighborhood and then really bad neighborhoods. If you're going to go to bad neighborhoods, yeah, you actually should dress up. You're not going to get hassled by the cops really that much, and a lot of people think you're a cop, so it's a win win. I mean, I mean, generally speaking, they could also think that you have a bunch of money. But generally, if you see someone walking through a neighborhood at one in the morning, and they're dressed really nice, and they carry themselves well, people think, that guy's a drug dealer, that guy's a cop, or that guy is someone who I'm going to rob. So your mileage may vary on that tactic, but I just got off work from Circuit City, I was all dressed up, and I go to Godfather's Pizza to hang out with my buddies, because all my friends worked there, because I used to work there as well. So I walk in, and I'm there for maybe 10 minutes, if if that, right? I'm like, well, hey guys, what's up? And my buddy Nick who I mentioned before on the show, comes into the Godfather's Pizza. Now, it's like 8 p.m. The place is packed. It's 8 p.m. It's a Friday night. Nick walks into Godfather's Pizza, and his Godfather's Pizza... This is great advertising for them, by the way. This is great uh, product placement for them. My boy Nick walks in, and his Godfather's T-shirt is ripped to shreds. It looks like he was attacked by the birds. Whether or not I do an ad for the Alfred Hitchcock collection, I haven't decided yet, but there, there's a little bit of an ad. So, Nick walks in, his shirt's ripped, and I'm laughing at him. Because how else are you going to react to a grown man walking into a pizza parlor with his shirt ripped to threads? I go, dude, what happened to you? And he goes, I just got jumped, man. So, what happened was, right outside Godfather's Pizza, there was this whole stupid thing. There were these two dudes, and Nick was like slept with one of their girlfriends or something like that. And... They came at him for retaliation. Now, you know, this is, it's small town, small suburb politics. Everyone's sleeping with each other's girlfriends, whatever. There's no, there's no reason to beat, beat somebody up. But anyways, this dude, we're going to call him Barney. And I didn't like this guy. I, I, I think this might have been the first time I'd seen him. I'd kind of heard about him. He was just kind of a jerk. I knew him on the periphery of my friends. Like, my friends kind of knew this guy. Whatever. I, I didn't like Barney. I think that's what I named him. I don't remember... But Barney brought with him the toughest guy in the area. And I'm not going to give his name. I know his name. I remember his name. But I'm not going to give his name. And you'll learn by the end of the story. But we're going to call him Douglas. Now, Douglas was six foot three. His his family had had issues with law enforcement. He it was a his uh, relative, close relative of his was serving life in prison. And they originally were a really good family, and then that happened, and the younger brother, Douglas, and it's not his real name, just kind of became a criminal. Like, that wasn't his career path. When he went to the school counselor, that was not on his check marks. That was not, that was not one of his options. But he kind of became a local... He was just kind of a thug, right? He was just kind of a thug. Now he was six foot three, and he was he was basic basically his career counselor should have said, oh, I think you should try that thug occupation. I think you have the right attributes to make that work. He was six foot three. I got to keep hammering that home, and he was just muscle. He was just a big muscle guy. So what happened was Nick pulled up. He just got done delivering some pizzas. <laughs> barely got away with his life because he was delivering pizzas in Rio Linda. He gets out of his car. And Douglas, and who was the other guy? I don't remember his name. What did I name the other guy? It doesn't matter. He he, he doesn't matter to the story. But Douglas gets out of the car and starts threatening Nick. Now, Nick is about my height. Nick's about 5'11". So there's already that height advantage. Also, he's not not an orc. So, but Nick was the, the best brawler of our crew. Like, Nick was easily the one that had been in the most fights... He, he, he was a very, very... He had a reputation for being a very good fighter. And while he's fighting Douglas, the fight breaks out. And they're just going at it. And the other dude's just kind of sitting, <laughs> sitting there. He, the other guy didn't really do anything other than inciting the whole thing. Douglas, at one point, as, they're, as he's punching Nick <laughs> multiple times, he picks Nick up. This is the strength of this guy. He picks Nick up 
and slams him on the hood of an innocent bystander's car. We're, this is a like a strip mall. And it's, again, a Friday night. There was, like, a nail salon and, like, a beauty store. And then there was, like, a liquor store and all that stuff. This fight breaks out in a parking lot. And Douglas picks up Nick and slams him into this girl's car so hard, he dented the hood. Like, it was, like, a straight-up, like, butt-sized dent in the hood of this car. So Nick comes in, and he goes, I just got jumped. I'm like, What? So then, uh, myself, I'm the fr- I'm the closest one to the door. Everyone else, all, my, all of our other friends are working there at Godfather's Pizza. So I go outside, right? You jump in my friend, like, you know, what's... Go- I had to have been in my early 20s. I was trying to remember the timeline. I think I was around 22, 23 when this happened. And I may have been a little bit younger, but I come out. And behind me, so I come out of the Godfather's Pizza. And behind me comes a couple of my friends. Josh and Jason were there. I think Matt and Troy might have been there. So I come out of Godfather's Pizza first. I got Jason, Josh behind me, and then I got some other guys. And then there was this big kid. This guy was the, he was also six foot three, but he was like 16 years old. And I don't remember his name. We'll call him Anthony. He comes out. So we're basically three layers deep. I'm in front. And then I got about two or three guys behind me. And then there's about two or three guys behind them. And then Anthony, not his real name is towering over the group from the very back. And right when I come outside, right when we form this little formation, because we don't really know what to expect. One of our friends have been jumped. We have to go out and take care of this situation, see? So when I come out, the first thing I see is Douglas coming towards... I only knew this guy by reputation. I I, I know this guy's name from around town, but I didn't know this was who I was going to be dealing with when I walked out of Godfather's Pizza. I walk out of Godfather's Pizza, I got all these people behind me. Douglas is coming towards me with the, I, I swear to God, it was the biggest Bowie knife I've ever seen in real life. It had to have been 12 inches long. The blade, that's not including the handle. I mean, his hand was wrapped around it, and this giant Bowie knife is coming right at me. The Alfred Hitchcock Classics Collection is available now in a 4K Ultra HD combo pack with a Blu-ray and digital code from Universal Pictures Home Entertainment. The collection includes, for the very first time, the original, never-released, uncut version of Psycho. Universally recognizes the master of suspense, the legendary Alfred Hitchcock directed some of cinema's most thrilling and unforgettable classics. The collection includes four iconic films from the acclaimed director's illustrious career, including Rear Window, Vertigo, Psycho, and The Birds in stunning 4K resolution. Starring Hollywood favorites such as James Stewart, Grace Kelly, Anthony Perkins, Janet Leigh, Tippi Hedren, Kim Novak, and Rod Taylor, this essential collection features hours of bonus features, as well as the original uncut version of Psycho for the first time ever. This collection with collectible disc book packaging includes hours of bonus features, such as documentaries, expert commentaries, interviews, screen tests, and much, much more. You see that suspense you were in? That's what Alfred Hitchcock can deliver to you with that Alfred Hitchcock Classics collection. Douglas gets Douglas is bringing this knife towards me, and it's not like it's not in his holster, okay, or sheath or whatever. It's it's in his hand, and it's pointed at me. It's pointed at my abdomen. And he's just, I want to say running towards me, but, but moving at a faster pace than you would feel comfortable when a man has a foot-long blade bowie knife. And I put my hands up, not like up in the air, like out in front of me, and I go, whoa, 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 whoa. And it's funny because I wasn't panicked. I've been in a lot of situations similar to this, you're not necessarily in panic, because if you're panicked, you don't make good decisions. And, you know, this is something that a lot of people, some people get and some people don't. You can't run away in this situation. You can. Like, right? As an adult, you can, you should, as long as you don't, you not have to worry about the safety of others. If you don't grow up in bad neighborhoods, you'd be like, okay, Jason, how far did you run when this happened? You can't run. Because then everyone in town knows that you're a punk. Like, you can't run. You can never show your face in that side of town again. People would just just mug you. I'd go, hey, Godfather's Pizza boys, how you doing? Everyone's mugging me. You can't run. Douglas is coming at me with the Bowie knife. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. And he gets about 
probably two feet from me. Remember, the blade... Okay, it, I, the blade seemed to be a foot long. It might have been nine inches. Sorry if I'm <laughs> exaggerating that. But he was in striking distance. Had he put his arm out straight, that's, I don't know if I would have a podcast. Whoa, 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 whoa. And I go, dude, put down the knife. Very, very calmly. And he didn't know me from anybody. He had no idea who I was. I had my own reputation, but not in, like, not... He was, like... He was not he was not a guy you'd want coming at you with a knife. Most people you wouldn't want coming at you with a knife, but he was a different le- I was a, like a troublemaker. I was like pushing over apple carts and stuff like that. I mean, I wasn't a, I wasn't a schoolboy, but I also <laughs> wasn't running down strip malls with a giant knife. So, I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa." And I go, "Dude, put the knife away." And he's sitting there and he looks at me. He doesn't know who I am. I got all these kids behind me. They they were all about I was let's say if I was 23, they would have been like 19, 20. He probably recognizes some of them and he's probably Nick isn't in that group, which was very very smart cuz had Nick been in that group of people, again, things may have turned out differently. Douglas has that knife and he's looking at me and he's kind of looking at behind me and then he takes a step towards me. And I go, whoa, I go, dude, you need to put the knife down. And he goes, that kid, I'm, I'm going to try not to cuss, but obviously you can fill in the cuss words here. He's all, that kid staring at me, man. That kid staring at me. What am I supposed to do, bro? Da-da. And I turn around and that 16-year-old kid who has eight people standing in front of him is mean mugging this dude with the knife. He's like scowling and stuff like that. And I turn around and I look at him and I'm like, what's your problem? He, he didn't know any. He's like a new employee, right? He'd been there for maybe like a month or two. He had no invested interest in this fight. I turn around. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, yo, man, what's up to this dude? And I turn around and I tell my friends, I'm like, get him out of here. That's why I remember Josh and Jason there. I think they were the ones who grabbed this kid and pulled him into Godfather's Pizza. To de-escalate things. Like, they just dragged this dude in. And I turn back around to Douglas, and I go, he's gone. And at that, I don't remember who yelled it, but at that point, someone went, the cops! And a, coming right around the corner, it's almost in slow motion, there's a black and white coming around the corner from where the BP gas station was. I'm turning, and I'm looking at the cop. Now, obviously, I'm not doing anything illegal right now. I mean, I guess... I am standing in the middle of a fight, but the cop cars, and I remember turning and the cop cars almost coming in slow motion. They didn't, they weren't running their, their lights. And when I look back, so I turn to look at the cops and he's coming around. Maybe he was driving very slowly. Maybe it wasn't a slow motion. As I turn around, I look over and I see Douglas. He had run back to his car and he threw the knife underneath his car. And then he started slowly walking back. At that point, The officer is there. The cop gets out of the car and he goes, hey, what's going on? I got to report there was a fight. Now, this is the key thing. Remember, I'm dressed up. Douglas looks like, you know, he's wearing his whatever, no fear shirt or whatever was popular back then. Nick, Nick's clothes are shredded, but he's still inside. And I tell the officer, I go, it was people just yelling, officer, people just yelling, fighting over a girl. You know how it is. He goes, I got to call it. There was a fight. And I go, it just people, it was just people yelling about a girl. And cop's like, okay, okay. And gets in his car. Now, if I had been dressed in head to toe, no fear clothing, I have the sleeves cut off the sleeves. Somehow it's quantum sleeveless. My hat was on backwards and all that stuff. He probably wouldn't have believed me. But because I look like I just got off work as a salesman, why would I lie? Yeah, I go, it was just people yelling over a girl and nothing. There's no big deal, officer. And he actually looked like he could care less. But again, he'd probably just come from a drive-by and was on his way to a meth bust. So if kids are fighting in the parking lot, he probably just would enjoy a five-minute nap before the next mass casualty event in the area. So he leaves. He leaves. Douglas gets in his car with his buddy. They leave. And I walk inside, and I go up to that dumb kid, that 16-year-old kid, and I go, what in the world were you thinking out there? What was going through... Oh, dude, I was furious. I go, what was going through your head? 
He's like, what? I'm not going to let anyone roll up on my homies, blah, 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 blah. And I said, listen, dude, you can talk all the trash you want when you're in front of the knife. But when I'm in front of the knife, you need to keep your mouth shut. I was furious. Because I knew at that point, see, the adrenaline, the incident's gone. The adrenaline's starting to leave. And I realized how much danger I was. In that moment, you're, you're just kind of thinking second to second. But now I'm starting to think, oh, dude, I almost got skewered. So my night's blown, right? Because this isn't how it ends. This is not how these stories ever end. I know what's going to happen next. So I order a pizza and get a soda. And I laugh. I laugh at the fact that Nick got his shirt all ripped up. And he tells me the fight. The, this, the, he didn't tell me that when he first walked in. He tells me this is what happened. Dude picked me up, dented the girl's car. And I'm thinking she must have been the one to call the police. Because the fight took place right outside of this beauty, like beauty supply store. I'm going to stay, stick around for a while. I'm going to order this pizza and drink the soda. Because I knew what was going to happen. About an hour later, we start getting phone calls to the Godfather's Pizza. Friends in the neighborhood. Calling up, hey, dude, what happened at Godfather's? Yeah, dude, telling the story. And then someone would be like, well, dude, Douglas is coming back to take care of that kid. Douglas is coming back. At midnight, he's going to come back, roll up on that kid. And you knew that was going to happen. You knew that was going to happen. So I'm sitting there, and, and, you know, as my fellow friends, they're getting off their shifts. They come, and we're just eating pizza, playing video games, drinking soda and stuff. Knowing full well at midnight, a man who carries around a giant knife is coming back to take care of this kid uh, for mean mugging him. And we're sitting there, we're drinking soda. And you, you, don't, you don't drink alcohol in these situations because you know that you're probably, it's probably not good if you're inebriated. You're drinking soda, eating pizza, stuff like that. And I remember, um, <laughs> I remember, like I said, I knew the guy by reputation. And I remember sitting there, and I think it was Nick who said, because we were talking about him, we we're like, yeah, you know, he's going to like beat the crap out of that kid. He's probably going to kill him. That kid is not a scrapper. He's a big guy, but Douglas is the same size, but more muscle, and he's fought a ton of people. And Nick was like, yeah, um, actually, I don't know if this story's true, but um, Douglas picked up a car once. And I was, I remember I'm drinking my soda, and I go, what? Nick's like, yeah, yeah, I picked up a car. <laughs> picked up a car once. And I go, what are you talking about? He picked up a car. He goes, so apparently this car full of girls broke down on Watt Avenue and he was driving by one night. And I don't know if he knew the girls or not. But they needed to change the tire and the jack didn't work. I don't know. If, again, this might just be urban legend and antelope, but their jack didn't work or it broke in the middle of it. So he picked up the back of the car so they could change the tire. So I'm like, I'm glad we're fighting Thanos. I thought it was just like, I thought his only superpower was the fact that he had a giant knife. But now apparently he can flip cars over. So I go, I'll be right back. I will be right back. So I got to my car. Now, here's the thing. You live in a bad neighborhood. There were no guns. Like people had guns. And again, that was like a high level criminal thing. Guns were very, very hard. You could get them in California, but they were you. It was so easy to get busted for having a gun. You you had to have a gun in one spot of your car and the ammo in the other spot of the car. You couldn't have the ammo in the gun. So you could have the clip or magazine, whatever it is, gun nuts. You can have the magazine in the or clip, whatever it doesn't matter. You can have the thing that holds the bullets in your glove compartment and your gun in the trunk, or your gun in your glove compartment and the ammo in the trunk. So, I mean, what's the point of that? What am I supposed to do? Throw bullets at them until I can run to the back of the trunk? It was just such a hassle to to carry a to own a firearm in California. You could only get a concealed carry permit if you were like a jeweler or you were a celebrity or you had a, a reasonable or plausible threats on your life. is very very difficult to do. So you, you you ran into people with guns. Usually they were illegally bought and operated they weren't like i'm using this for lawful purposes but i bought it for 300 dollars on the black market so most of the people you ran into carried bats and knives occasionally you get a chain a chain like apparently they saw some jackie chan movie guys running around with a ladder spinning it around on his neck i always thought chains were too impractical you could just someone's like spinning it at you and then you like karate chop it again assuming you're thanos and then it hits their head so I always had bats with me. In California, it was a very interesting law. If you had a bat in your car, you also had to have a ball and a glove. A baseball. You can't have a basketball. 
You'd have to have a ball and a glove, otherwise the bat was considered a deadly weapon in your car. If you had a ball and a glove, you're on your way to a Little League game, officer. So a lot of times I had bats. I had a broken boat oar. You know, in, you know in video games where you use a weapon and then it wears out <laughs> and then you can't use it anymore? That's what happened to my boat oar. I use, I'll tell that story someday. I've actually had that story written on my idea board for like eight months. I'll tell you the story about how I used the boat oar until the <laughs> strength level dropped to zero and it shattered. But I had a boat oar. I had some knives like like pocket knives and stuff like that, but I'm never a huge fan of them. What I was known for, because here's the thing, the key to winning fights is not getting in fights. The key to winning every single fight is to to not get in the fight in the first place. So if you knew a guy in your neighborhood who had a shotgun, you're probably not going to pick a fight with him. If the guy with the shotgun knew someone in the neighborhood who had a flamethrower, the guy with the shotgun's not starting the flamethrower fight. Even though you figure a shotgun's a better weapon than a flamethrower, Someone who owns a flamethrower is insane, or they're in a World War II movie. Someone, or Elon Musk. <laughs> I guess he's just the insane guy. But if someone came to a street fight with a flamethrower, the, the fight's over, right? The fight's just over. You're like, ah, who do we have? Do we have like a sniper rifle or rocket launcher guy? No, no, just give it to the flamethrower guy. So one day, like that movie, Fra- Frailty, I was walking through my grandpa's garage. And it was almost like it was almost like an angel delivered this to me because this this thing became my trademark. And I don't think I ever got in another fight. It was almost like a lucky talisman, or it was just so insane. No, but just knowing that I had it in my possession, people are like, oh dude, I don't want to fight Jason, dude. So I went through my grandpa's garage one day, and there was like a beam of light shining down on it. I found a hay hook. Now, if you don't know what a hay hook is, maybe you've seen I Know What You Did Last Summer. I actually had the hay hook before that movie came out. I, w- I didn't rip them off. They ripped me off. I remember one night Josh woke me up and go- he goes, dude, dude, they're making a movie about you. And that was the first time we were seeing trailers for I Know What You Did Last Summer. I had this hay hook. So it's basically, it was all, it was just a steel. It was like a wooden handle. Everything else was steel. And it was just this sharp hook. And actually, now that I think about it, it wasn't sharp, and that actually made it a little scarier. You could tell that this was an old tool. I mean, it looked terrifying. And so I took it, and I I stole it from my grandpa, because, you know, I was going to put it to good use. And everyone found out I carried a hay hook. People would be like, yo, what's that? What is that in your trunk? And I'm like, this? Oh, this is my hay hook. You know, in case, you know, something pops off, you know, I'll pull out my hay hook. And you would think it's such a stupid weapon. And and looking back on it, I think even then I realized this, it really only has one, like a baseball bat you can use offensively and defensively. A boat oar is the same thing. It's so long that you can just push people back with it. You can block chains, block ladders, and then you can also conk people with it. Conk them on the head and little stars, comical stars. Not, not medical concussions happen. Baseball bat's the same thing. You can use it as an offensive or defensive weapon. You can use a bat to open a like a door or something like that. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe Thanos could. But knives, they're only offensive weapons. You can't use a knife to really block anything. They're quite scary. A hay hook, the guy with the knife versus the guy with the hay hook. In a fight, the guy with the knife will win strategically because there's so many ways you can wield it. A hay hook can really only be wielded in a broad overhand or side motion but if you get hit with it once you're not going anywhere like people in prison or even real life you can get stabbed a couple times and they keep walking down the street and then you're like oh man you're bleeding if you're stabbed in the right or wrong location depending on how you think about it you may not even feel it initially the hay hook you're stuck where i am now like even even if i just got your foot Okay, like, you're not going anywhere. I'm holding onto your foot with this metal hook. Terrifying weapon. It was a psychological weapon. I never once used it in a fight. Never. It was a psychological weapon. I didn't have to use it. The fact that people knew that I possessed this thing that looks like it came out of a serial killer's collection. I have no idea where it came from, honestly. But the fact that people knew that I had it, people, people, it, 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 It parted the seas for me as far as people wanting to mess with me. 
my reputation was, yeah, I'd fight, but I was also just wanted to hang out and play Goldeneye and stuff like that. And that was kind of Nick's reputation, too. You fought when you had to. But then I had this hayhook, and that was just kind of the end of it. People were like, well, just let him play Goldeneye as long as he wants. He can pick odd job. Just just let him do it. I'm playing the game with the hayhook. I'm hitting all the buttons. Anyways, so I walk out to my car, and I get my hayhook. And at the same time, this is going to date this episode. This is probably the most embarrassing part of the episode. <laughs> the fact that I was walking around with a hay hook, I used to wear a trench coat all the time. Actually, I can date this story now. Because I stopped wearing the trench coat after Columbine. I was like, uh, <laughs> okay. Before, I just wore a trench coat because it looked cool, right? It was like Agent Mulder I'm wearing a trench coat around. <laughs> Except I was much, much younger and much more pudgier. But I would wear. I had this black trench coat I wore everywhere. And people go, oh, he's a goth kid and stuff like that. And I wasn't. I just really like trench coat. And here's a little fun fact for you. Did you know that if you have a hay hook attached to your belt and you're wearing a trench coat, nobody will ever know. No one will ever know. I grab my hay hook out of my trunk and I throw on my trench coat and I walk back in to Godfather's Pizza. And at that point, I just sit back down. It's, it's, it's surprisingly comfortable sitting down with a hay hook attached to your clothes. I sit back down, just drinking soda, eating pizza, Killing time. Now, did I think I was going to have to use this hay hook on this dude? I mean, obviously, you don't want to. It's uh, it's super unwieldy. I know this guy's a better fighter than me. I know he has a better weapon than I do. But I didn't have anything to do with any of this. See, I was Nick's friend, but I wasn't talking trash to him. I wasn't trying to instigate the fight. The guy who was messing with him, I got rid of him. And I had an ace in my hole. And I knew this. I knew this as I was waiting for midnight. I knew that I had a card to play. Now, again, I knew this. I knew this guy by reputation. He was, he was a bit violent, and apparently he can pick up cars. But he had to have been around the city, like 20 or something like that. I knew I had an ace in the hole. The number one key, again, to winning fights is not to get in fights. And the best way not to get in fights is to be able to talk to people, to communicate things with people. People are just being insane. They're just saying insane things. Then you you have to fight or you call the cops, right? But if they're rational people, you can sit down and have a conversation with them. The key is knowing whether or not the person is rational before they pull out a giant knife. It's a little early. It's probably like 1150 or something like that. If Douglas is anything, he's a punctual man who wants to murder. He actually, the word was he wanted to beat this kid up, but we all knew he wanted to go behind this donut shop. So in this parking lot, you probably pull all this up on Google Maps, on the far end of the parking lot, the darkest end of the parking lot. I mean, it had to be about three, 400 yards away from Godfather's Pizza. There was a donut shop. It was closed. All the lights were out. It was basically bordering on this creepy forest going into, uh, I don't remember what that part of land was, but it was near Dyer's Lane. It's not a place that you want to be day or night. That's where he, Douglas wanted the fight to happen. And we know, we're like, well, he's going to murder him over there. Like, even if he doesn't mean to, the man can pick up cars, right? And he slammed Nick into a car and dented that hood. And again, I was like, "That's we got to take care of that too. But Douglas pulls up. And I don't remember who was in the passenger seat. It wasn't the guy who sparked the thing off. It was one of his boys. Because that's how you go to a fight, right? You don't go to a fight alone because you don't want to get jumped. You may not want to jump other people, but you got to have somebody with you. So he brought another kid with him. I assume the guy was a brawler. I didn't know the guy. I never saw him afterwards. But that car pulls up. I tell that stupid Anthony kid, stay in Godfathers. Stay in Godfathers. And I walk out wearing my very cool and fashionable at the time trench coat. And got a little hay hook. My belt loop. I walk out to the car. And Douglas is just sitting there looking straight ahead into Godfather's Pizza. And I, I walk up to the car. His windows roll down. I go, hey, listen, man. I go, that kid's an idiot. That kid's an idiot and he deserves to get his ass kicked. I agree. But he's 16 years old. Okay? We were 16 years old once. We thought we were the toughest guy around. You got to cut the guy break, dude. And Douglas, without even really looking at me, goes, I don't care. That kid's got to pay. He's going to get his ass beat. Da, 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 da. That wasn't my ace in the hole. Then I said this. Hey, listen, man. When that cop car pulled up, I saw you throw the knife under your car. And I could have ratted you out. I could have told the cop right there what I saw. And this wouldn't happen. 
but I didn't. I did you a favor. Do me a favor. And leave the kid alone. I played my card. I set it right down on the table. And he sat there. He's staring into Godfathers. He's thinking about it. And then without saying a word, he just nods his head, puts the car in reverse, drives home. About a week or two later, some I'm not going to say who this guy's name was because, you know, he was making a rude comment to me. I don't want to throw him under the bus. He may feel differently now, but a couple, maybe like a week later, um, one of the guys who was involved, one of the guys in the group, he goes, yeah, so you didn't, you didn't rat out Douglas because you were afraid. You were afraid he was going to come after you. And I remember saying this. I go, listen, the last thing that kid needs is to be in prison. That's not going to help him at all. Because I knew his story. I knew that he came from a good family, and then a member of the family made a tragic mistake, and he was psychologically paying for it. He was doing not great stuff out there. I mean, he was helping women change their tires on their car. That, that's good. But I remember saying that. I go, I wasn't afraid of it. I, he, the, him going to prison would serve nobody any good at all. That dude, Douglas, now, last I checked, because I was talking to someone about it about a couple of years ago, married with kids, has a great job. He moved past it. He moved past that time period in his life. So I know I made the right call. And oddly enough, this is why I don't really remember Anthony's name. I probably could have remembered it, but that's why I gave him a fake name too. Oddly enough, Three years later, me and Nick were walking through Citrus Heights one night because for some reason I thought the movie theater was open at three in the morning. We were inebriated that night. It was like a three-mile walk. I remember we were walking. We ran into Anthony. At this point, he's 19 years old. His brain was rotted out on drugs. Like, I, he didn't recognize us. He wanted to fight us. And we're like, dude, what are you talking? We know you, dude. Remember from Godfather? He's just like, what? What are you talking? I mean, he, I don't know what drug he was on. Um, I don't want it. I don't want to be anywhere near it. We had to talk him out. Uh, he was just nuts. He was nuts. Um, he was harsh in our buzz, man. We're going to the movies at three in the morning. We walked all the way to the front of the movie theater. And Nick's like, why did I let you talk me into this? Why did you think there would be a movie showing at three in the morning? I'm like, I don't know, bro. Anyway, so that kid ended up blowing his brain on drugs. I hope he's doing better now. He's kind of gotten lost in the mists of time. But Douglas left that life behind. It's funny because the end of the story, too, I guess I should add this because I kind of kept referencing it. The other part of the story, so we got that situation taken care of. This is just, again, just a, this was like a 24-hour time period in my life, in my 20s. This situation got taken care of, but now we have something else going on. We have a bunch of witnesses who watched this fight break out and this girl's car get dented when the Infinity Gauntlet punched the hood of her car. So I go, listen, this isn't over. Because at any point, she could file an insurance claim and the cops could get involved and she's going to start giving me witness statements. And I don't know if it was, I think it was the next day because I kind of want to just get this taken care of. It might have been the day after that. but So a 48 hour time period in my life. Remember, I walked over to the beauty store. We knew who whose car it was because we saw her come out and kind of look at the damage. Walked into the beauty store, and I scribbled down a phone number of a garage that I knew, like a mechanic's garage. And I go, listen, really sorry about what happened. I was just very nice as well for this. I go, sorry for what happened to your car the other night. It was very unfortunate. Here's a phone number of a garage. Here's some cash. They'll fix it for you. And this is the end of it. She's like, okay. Walked out. So, the, again, we needed to finalize everything. We needed to finalize everything. Because I didn't need the cops going after Douglas. I didn't definitely didn't need the cops going after my boy Nick, right? <laughs> Basically, it's a crime to get thrown into someone's car. So that is a true crime Jason Carpenter story. There's not many that I can actually tell. Sometimes I'm just like a neighborhood vandal and stuff like that. And a lot of times I'll laugh about those privately. When I'm up late at night, I'll chuckle to myself. But they're not really podcast material because basically it turns me in to Dennis the Menace, but like super villain level pranks. Like stuff you're like, oh my god, this is terrible. Maybe you guys would find it funny. I don't I don't know. Every so often I'll bring one up and Sabine will be like, don't tell that story on the podcast, dude. 
So I'm telling this one instead. It was basically a 48-hour period of my life in my 20s when I was hanging out with my friends. And and I, I think the point of this story, other than <laughs> the fact that I wheeled a hayhook and I fought a supervillain, a little asterisk, I fought him with my words, you see. And now he's a good guy. Now he's like Magneto in the New Mutants. He was a good guy. I think it's just an interesting story, and I think that incidents like that, when I reflect back on them, make me realize how far I've come. Because obviously I used to be like a knuckle duster type of guy. Like I used, like I went out there assuming I was going to get in a fight when I walked out of that Godfather's Pizza. I didn't know a knife was going to be drawn on me. I didn't know it was Douglas. But when I found that out, I didn't run away. Again, you can't do that. You just kind of had to stand your ground. And I think now, nowadays when trouble comes, I know a bunch of cops in town. And I have friends with law enforcement. So nowadays when someone messes with me, I'm just like, oh, okay. Uh, talk to my buddy at the station. That's a privilege of getting older. When, you're, when you get older and you start meeting people, you start making friends, you'll make fr- I ended up, it was so weird. I used to... Tell cops, there's nothing going on here, officer. And then as I got older, I had a bunch of buddies who were cops in Sacramento and up in Hood River. I have a bunch of buddies who are in various levels of law enforcement and things like that. So nowadays, I (laughs) I don't even have the time. I'm just like, "Uh, can you take care of this for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if there's really a moral. But there is definitely. I wanted to tell, because I've told conspiracy stories that involve me. And I've told paranormal stories that involve me. I wanted to tell a true crime story that involved me that didn't that didn't involve me basically pulling Cartman level pranks on half a city block because those are the other stories. I will tell the boat or story one of these days because that is another one. That was a story where words didn't matter because when I had that boat or I stood between a bleeding man who was going to die within the next 10 minutes and a vicious, nightmare-inducing creature. Totally real. It was in the newspaper, and there was a ton of witnesses. But I will tell that story on another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great weekend, guys. 